All right, good evening, everybody. Great show tonight from Shehab Burke. We're going to be spending some time to talk about questions that uh, you have. We are dedicating most of the hour for your questions, so bring them on early because uh, we felt that we do that every once in a while, and this is a great opportunity. Oh, yeah, it's fun. The look on my face is I'm excited because you never, you know, we have lots of time for questions. It means uh, people have the time to formulate some uh, good talking points uh, for us, for sure. However, Visa Bulletin is released, so we're going to spend a minute to talk about it, and then we'll turn our attention to your important yes. um, questions. Uh, I'm Sam Shehab with the law firm of Shehab Burke, and with me... Ryan Burke, also from Shehab Burke. Very excited. We are immigration attorneys. We practice immigration law uh, in the U.S. and throughout the world, uh, focusing on employment immigration and uh, family immigration. And we spend together uh, an hour uh, every Monday at 6 o'clock to talk about any issue of interest to you and anything that we see that's important that we can share with you and try to have fun and pass on some of the knowledge or information that we have uh, on to you and take your questions. And sometimes you give us some knowledge and information. We learn a lot from you as well. Um, in the Q&A sessions, there's no attorney-client privilege is established. Uh, we remind everybody that uh, do not rely on the information we give you to make a decision on your case. Uh, consult with an attorney of your choice to make a decision on your case before you sell the house or uh, buy the airline ticket, et cetera, et cetera. And immigration stuff is important. Uh, I imagine the average person in our audience probably has about 10 years into the U.S. immigration process. And, you know, we take those things uh, very seriously and don't make rash decisions or recommendations and thereby, you know, so shouldn't you. So, yeah. so uh, December Visa Bulletin, uh, USCIS is taking dates for filing. Correct. Uh, so that's, that's good yeah. news and I got it here in front of me. That's why I'm looking to my left because I'm looking at the, uh, at the screen to my left that, talk, that shows that, uh, that detail. Yeah. And then there has been some movement, Brian. Yeah. Um, so movement, uh, I'm looking at the, first of all, I looked, I looked at the uh, dates for, uh, for filing with very little movement. But the final action uh, dates have a uh, bit of movement there for employment base in the realm of China, uh, which I guess is, isn't terribly surprising. But, you know, EB2 uh, dates, final action dates and EB3 uh, final action dates for uh, China uh, both jumped uh, an odd number, 22 days. Uh, EB2 went to uh, first to, to October 22nd, 2019, from October 1st, 2019. And EB3 went from 1st of January 2020 to January 22nd, 2020. So that's good news. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what does that mean? It means that, you know, I guess during the last month or so, um, uh, Department of State thinks that the government has, you know, run through um, the... Everybody who, who had a priority date of, of January 1st, 2022, uh, January 20, excuse, uh, EB3, January 1st, 2020, to January 2021, and, uh, or rather, 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 they think they got to, they took care of everybody prior to this, they move it forward to take it to issue more green cards, more green cards available, approve more cases, there you go. So, yeah. there, and there's very little in terms of notation on anything that we should worry about with the visa bulletin. It's really thin on details. Yeah, it's for, what you're referring to, I think, is, you know, at the end of the visa bulletin, they sometimes say something, you know, interesting about what's going on in the visa bulletin. <clears throat> and the only note they have on there this month is one about the employment-based uh, fourth preference for uh, religious workers, which, you know, we do those. However, there's not really, uh, in our audience here, I don't think there's too many uh, uh, out there. And it's not really a common visa category uh, anyway. So uh, that's the visa bulletin. Not much change, but now we have a December one. And, you know, my immediate thought is let's look forward to the January one. And that's the one where I feel like we're going to see, we're more likely to see interesting movement because I believe it was on, I have a copy of it right here, the November visa bulletin. It says, Hey, uh, remember, these are these movements are designed to be kept in line with our quarterly visa allocations. Maybe it was the um, the uh, October one that, that said that, but uh, there you go. So, uh, shall we uh, hit upon some questions? Yeah, uh, so, so a couple questions came by email, and uh, as everybody here are throwing their questions on the screen, we'll take them as well. Yeah. Uh, Looks like there's a bunch already. But there, here's a really interesting one yeah. that I got, uh, which is uh, the second on the list here, Brian. Sure. 
My six-year H-1B is expiring on December 12, 2024. Not so far off, yeah. Yeah, and my perm has been filed on December 20th, 2023. That's impossible because that's the future, as an aside. Uh, I mean, yeah. we'll be filed. Yeah, yeah, looks yeah, like, yeah, 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 there you go. It looks like we'll be filed on December 2023. Uh, this is the date that looks like his attorney gave him mm -hmm. that he can file it. Basically, when, yeah. when you do some recruitment, and there is a waiting period, so that's probably the earliest possible day. Sure, I, I guess it's when you're expect, expecting to, to file. Okay, I understand. Yeah. yeah. So, so I'm a nitpicker. Like, what can I say? No, no, that's a good, uh, good, good point. Um, can I apply? So his, this person is worried about his H-1B extension beyond six years, because if you look at it here, is uh, on December twentieth, twenty twenty-four, um, he would have crossed. Yeah. So he can f he can file. He c can he. Wait until, what does he need to do? Wait until December 12th? Tw um. The problem, well, the problem I see with this, this mm -hmm. fact pattern again is, you know, somebody saying, you know, I'm, my perm is going to be filed on December 20th, 2023, and my H-1B six-year maximum is December 12th, 2024, and the rules allow you to file uh, for one-year extensions of your yeah. H-1B status as long as you have filed your Perm. Uh, yeah, he has a seven-day gap. Yeah, uh, yeah, because this, this per well, I'll finish the thought, and obviously yeah. your answer is there, is if you file the perm more than one year uh, before you reach the end of your six years. Right. And the problem is, you know, uh, the perm, based upon this time frame, won't be filed more than one year before you hit your uh, extension. You, you, hit, you hit your more than one year before your H-1B time is up. Yeah. So what do you do in that scenario, Sam? Well, it's, it's we tell them, take a vacation. Yeah. Take a vacation between now and next and December, so you have plenty of time, and probably that person will take vacation. Yeah. Anyways. Yeah. Well, uh, a vacation of, outside of the United States. Outside, step outside. Yeah, they definitely go go to the Bahamas, go to Mexico, uh, go somewhere nice and sunny for a week. Yeah. The point is that uh, when it comes to calculating your true H-1B six-year maximum, they apply the concept that we call recapture, and that they only count uh, to the days you are physically present in the United States on H-1B status towards the total six years on H-1B. Meaning uh, all you gotta do to essentially push out your six year maximum is to leave the United States for, you know, this person's case, about a week and, uh, you know, add a couple days just for, for cushion and uh, come back after that and your H-1B six year maximum is now beyond one year from when you filed your perm meaning you can suddenly file your H-1B extension as one of those people who can say, ah, my perm was filed more than one year before my H-1B time was up. Yeah. A fun little, little hack. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Excellent point. So leave the U.S. for a week or two, and you're good. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. So uh, this is an interesting one here. This gentleman, he is on L-1A visa. Yeah. Um, and he started, looks like, five, six months ago on L-1A visa. Uh, and now he is not feeling solid with his job. Mm -hmm. And he said, I got an approved H-1B. I was on H-1B back in 2015. Can I change status from L-1A to H-1B? But that, that, that H-1B in 2015 was never stamped and he's never been on the U.S. on H-1B. So uh, as you know, the rules tend to read, uh, that person would, would still be considered subject to the H-1B cap as I read the, read the rules. It's essentially, uh, if you go dig down deep, it says you should have been on H-1B status, i.e. gotten a change of status with a 994, or actually uh, or got, gotten, gotten stamped and uh, entered the country on H-1B status. Meaning, I think there's a, it's possible that the government can challenge that, uh, whether or not you're eligible for H-1B again. However, uh, as, a, as a practical matter, they tend to approve these, these cases. As long as that H-1B, that original H-1B is still approved, I would still give a pretty good chance of them approving uh, this case. Don't turn your resignation until you get the H-1B approval. That's a very, very, very good uh, point. You never, never count your immigration. But strictly according to the rules, yeah. uh, that H-1B uh, is not good. Yeah. Uh, uh, well... The H-1B itself is, is, is good, but it's a matter of, you know, um, well, were you counted? Is your cap counting still in place is, is, the, is the problem, yeah. Yeah. Maybe take one of these, uh, take one of these live questions yeah. Uh, here? Yeah, yeah, sounds good. Oh, I've got to make that bigger so we can stand a chance of reading it. There we are. Uh, maybe a little bit smaller. Uh, 
Uh, there it's you go. Temperamental today. Yeah. There you go. It's being temperamental. So, hey, Sam and Brian. First of all, thanks for all that you do. I have two questions. If I lose my job on I-45 EAD, how long do I have to find a new job, assuming the EAD card is still valid till the end of 2025? Well, that's an excellent question. Yeah. Um, th and this, and this uh, question, Brian, there is um, no clear guidelines uh, from USCIS on that. Um, and I've had people who had gaps in their employment as long as it, around when the time came around the interview, they were employed, it was okay. Yeah, I do recall a couple of scenarios where people have been out of work and gotten an I-485 Supplement J RF, RFV, and the response has been, you have, a, I don't have a watch on, but you have, you know, 90 days or 87 days to uh, find a job and get somebody to sign a Supplement J on your behalf to, you know, so I guess that's the worst case, case scenario. If the government comes knocking, you need to be able to provide a offer yeah. of permanent employment. Yeah, but the, if the employment gap gets bigger and bigger, Brian, the potential of a challenge gets more likely. I would agree, and they even said that in their recent policy statement from back in September, saying we would find it interesting if there are long gaps of unemployment, uh, uh, gaps in employment in your history, or you're working in a different occupation for a long amount of time. However. I would really like to, to see that USCIS, that theoretical USCIS denial on that scenario. Well, deny your I-40, I mean, my position would be as long as you have an I-45 a job in a job ready in the occupation uh, when your green card's ready, I think you should be good. Be, I, I think you should. But um, again, we've read their policy and it's very interesting. I would love to be, okay, I would not want to be challenged on that, but it's a very interesting challenge because what would they have to do, Sam? Would they have to, to invalidate the I-140 uh, then, then is, does that, is that what they do? USCIS always struggles with that question because what you're saying is legally the relevant moment in time yeah. as to whether or not you get that green card is whether or not you're employed on the day the government is ready to hand you a green card. Any time prior to that, legally is not significant per the strict interpretation of the rule. It's job yeah. offer at the time of the green card. Approval. There's no requirement that anybody work uh, work for the green card sponsoring employer until a green card is actually in their hands. That's why we can do it for people who have never even been to the United States before. Yes, 100%. However, however, uh, we have seen hints that USCIS does not like that. Yeah. One of them is the reference to the um, memo in September what was that related to, Brian? Do you recall? That was part of that was part of the just the, F, the that was like their FA a, a bunch of FAQs relating to the long pending employment uh, green green cards. Where they said, you know, we might find it interesting if you had you know long period. I think they said, you know, if you weren't working in the occupation uh, in your offered occupation for for a long long time. So I I can't consider that. The, That's the October visa bulletin FAQ. Yeah, the, the well, I think yeah, it came out around, like, around yeah. yeah. It's the October because I had to place it in my head. It's yeah. the October visa bulletin USCIS released an FAQ. Yeah. They up, well, they updated their employment-based adjustment of status uh, yeah. FAQ. So if anybody's looking to read about it, uh, Sai, for example, yeah. you can do a Google search for USCIS employment-based uh, adjustment of status FAQ. And they mentioned that they want they want at certain time in the future they want to revisit this issue. That's the, probably the best way to explain yeah. it because they're kind of saying long term of unemployment may bring doubt as to whether or not the job offer is bona fide. Well, I mean, just changing uh, jobs during the pendency of a, uh, well, not that's another time where we're seeing, you know, not working for the green card sponsor being an issue is really when it comes to actually filing the initial I-45. That was something that I viewed as an interview trigger when uh, we filed a bunch of, you know, everybody filed green cards in October 2020. And the people who were much more likely to get interviewed were the were ones who weren't working for the green card sponsor employer at the time they filed the I-45. I'll mention two things, sure. and then we'll move on to the next one. The first thing um, is I think this gentleman's size issue can become problematic if he lost his job with company A yeah. and then came back at the interview and claimed that he's have a bona fide offer of employment with company A. He did not exercise AC21 to go somewhere else. Mm. To me, it's all fact driven. To me, then that loss of job for a long time with company A might conflict or create doubt as to whether company A has a bona fide Ever had job. a bona fide, well, for yeah. at least for the first 180 days or so, yeah. yeah. But if you do AC21 and move to a company B, I think you're, it's less problematic. Yeah. That's number one. Yeah. The second point I'd like to add is 
looking back historically, uh, back I'm going back many years uh, when they did the 2007, made everything current and filed thousands, thousands of adjustment of status. Yeah. Uh, a year later or two years after that, USCIS exercised an interesting RFP to a lot of these adjustments. I think I know what uh, you're going to say. Give yeah. us, prove that you're employed and show us your employment and uh, and denied a lot of adjustment based on that because yeah. they were you unable. You weren't employed. Yeah. You were an employer who couldn't prove that you were employed at the time. Um, that threw in the third one for me is, remember, if you find yourself in that predicament, self-employment always a good answer. Yeah. Uh, that gets you out of trouble. Let's take the next one. Yeah. We can talk about this for another half an hour. Oh, yeah. Well, you know me. I can talk for, talk for everybody. Well, this is a good, yeah. good one, though. Yeah. A lot of good stuff in it. So I think there's a, a, a second question from Sai. So there sure. you go. Um, if I am on H-1B during a job loss, how can I switch over to using my EAD card? Is it by entering the, entering the country with the EAD card, assuming I have a valid AP attached to it? Ah, uh, what a fan, you know, it's a fantastic question that I think we just sort of take for granted uh, around yes. Uh, here. Yes. It's, I guess this falls in the category of how will they know? How will they, how will they know that I've left behind my H1, H-1B mm -hmm. status? Mm -hmm. And Maybe I'll, I'll put it this way. Think of your, your green card track and your H-1B <laughs> as two different, you know, vehicles, both moving along independent with one another. You're going, and, uh, and this metaphor, Sam, you're much better at metaphors than me. You're going down the highway, you've got a leg on, e leg on, on, on each, each car, and you're, and you're moving along uh, just, just fine. Um, when you, I guess I'll make it simple. My metaphor is falling apart. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's okay. When, when yeah. you leave behind your H-1B status, as long as you have a pending green card, uh, you're pending I-45, you're allowed to stay in the United States pursuant to that. There's no notice that goes to the government. There's no alarm that gets uh, that, get, that goes off on their end. I guess if your employers, your H-1B employers, doing their job properly, they should be withdrawing your H-1B. But there's nothing you have to do as long as at any time, no matter what status you're on, if you have a, a, a well, uh, let's maybe walk that back there, a bit. There's a lot of things in immigration law. The government does not want to know about it, but it, ch it happens, it changes. Yeah. Uh, for example, to give you an example, um, if, you, if a student stops studying, yeah. they become out of status. Yeah. Uh, you, there's no, uh, I mean, there may be a CVS update. The school DSO might eventually figure it but, out, but yeah. But USCIS does not have to take action, you're just out of status. When do they know how to deal with it is when this person shows up you know, later on with an asking for another benefit. Yeah, yeah. They're going to say, oh, you were out of status. Yeah. So they don't have to know. Uh, another example is when you... Um, Work without author authoriza authorization. Yeah. You know, um, they won't... There's, again, there's no office somewhere where a little red light goes on when somebody works without authorization because they don't know. Uh, but they, next time you're asking for an immigration benefit, they'll ask you, oh, have you worked without authorization in the United States? And, you know... You're supposed to tell the truth there. That's how they how they catch you. But you know, I've been to green card interviews with, with people where the government says, "Oh yeah, by the way, ten years ago X Y Z. You know, did you do something wrong immigration wise?" So, uh, I guess the short answer for Sai here is that they don't know. There's nothing you have to do as long as you have a pending I-45, employment-based I-45 still that was you know properly filed timely. Uh, having that pending on your behalf allows you to stay in the United States if your H-1B goes. Up in, up in smoke, unfortunately. And it's an excellent question because, truthfully, there is no way that you can use intuition to answer that question. Because, for example, if somebody on H-1B moved from location A to location B, oh, no, you must tell the government, and you must pay a fee, and you have to file a new application. So this is a simple move from one city to the other, and all hell break loose if you don't do it correctly. But here is you switch from H-1B to EAD, they can say, oh, we don't want to know. We're fine. We'll let you know later. So there's no consistency in the way the government handles yeah. things. So it's not an intuition thing. It's something that you just learn it. Oh, yeah. It's and just, that's difficult for a lot it's of people. A, it's a very important note. I mean, there's so much they don't ask about. Most people, you know, most people uh, in our audience, if they're on H-1B status, they don't sign those H-1B forms. They don't know what goes into those forms. They don't ask about, you know, has the employee ever worked without authorization in the United States? Have they ever committed a crime? <laughs> They don't ask about crimes on on the H one H one B forms. They mm -hmm. save uh, they save up their issues, uh, not all the time, but they sometimes they save up their issues for when you're applying for something. And the most common scenario where issues come out is you know final green card application uh, yeah. uh, filing, or in the case of somebody's already filed one, maybe uh, during an interview they'll say, "Hey, where are you working at uh, right now?" Yeah. yeah. So. 
All right, excellent uh, question. So uh, Sai gave us a pretty good question yeah. here, and I got one from Srinivasan, I yes. think. From S. Srinivasan. Yeah. S. Srinivasan. Does the automatic visa revalidation uh, for short visit to Canada apply if the previous visa held was a different category, i.e. F1 visa holder who received change of status to H1B and currently uh, main Gaining, uh, and is it part two here? Part two here? Uh, H1B status, but has not ever had an H1B stamping. You did have F1 stamping, which still has not expired. This is identical to question number one that we have here that came in. Oh. Uh, it's the same. Got changed to status from F1 OPT to H1B approved. Student was in DS, still change of status. Does the automatic visa revalidation apply for his 15-day visit to Canada? What status am I yeah. on when I return? So uh, I guess in the base, baseline, the magic of automatic visa revalidation is that the visa that's revalidated doesn't have to be in the same category in which you're seeking to enter the United States. It's yes. really kind of the short, the short answer of it. Uh, automatic visa revalidation does, you know, stress me out a, a little, a little bit because you're going without, you know, uh, your documents uh, ma match matching up, you know, per, per se. But uh, yeah, it's, yes, uh, and it has become very popular uh, in the last uh, five to ten years. But this is, has been in the books. Oh yeah, for for generations, uh, and was not very popular. And when we used it, it was a lot more stressful because. Uh, you're gonna get one of these, huh? What a what now? Look, yeah. What what? What a what? Visa validation? Yeah, yeah. Um, I had this case um, that I've shared before, where I given the letter to somebody. This is like 25 years ago, uh, explaining the law, and the client who eventually made it, but not on that trip back to the U.S. Um, they told me they put my piece of paper on the table, and there were about like seven officers looking at it staring at it, completely confused, and then decided, no, there's no such thing as automatic visa revalidation. They've never heard of it before. Um, and the guy had to leave and then come back again. That's the, the funny thing about you know customs uh, but To finish the thought, don't worry about visa revalidation today. It's very popular. This is a long time ago, and it yeah. wasn't. As long as you do it right, you're good. Yeah, meet the, but just yes, make sure you meet you, the requirements. Yeah. yeah, and it's on the Customs yeah. and Border web, uh, CBP uh, website uh, now. They have a nice little page about it there explaining what the requirements are. Uh, yes, just are, give them are, the link and they have to look it up on their own website, yeah. which is great. I think I like to think that they'll, they'll believe their own uh, their website. Own website yeah. Yes. Uh, okay. Let's see what we got here. From Blessing Ade, Ade Salir. Uh, forgive my pronunciation there. Hi, Sam and Brian. I have a priority date of October 2022 as an EB3 skilled worker. Uh, okay. Can you give an indication of when you think that might become current, please? So, really... Um, uh, so, I don't know the country of birth. Yeah, that, that so... Uh, and that changes things not, a little bit. Let's, let's, you know, not take something else for granted. Let's remind everybody, you know, where you, in what immigration line you fall is based upon the country where you're born. It's not based upon where you are a citizen. If you've, you know, changed citizenships or added one, it's based upon where you were physically born on the first surface of the planet, the country in which you were born. Um, and... Or the country where the, your spouse is born, you can take advantage if... The place of birth of yeah. the spouse is more advantageous. Well, there's a follow-up here from uh, Blessing a Day maybe Salir, would, uh, where we maybe get some more give information. Us, yeah. Any thoughts on the visa, December visa bulletin and the uh, predictions for January? You're predicting a big jump. Let me see if there's anything else down here from this individual. Oh, rest of the world. Uh, Sorry, I got it. We got it. Yeah, we yeah. got it. Okay, good job, Brian. Good job catching it. Yeah, now, okay. yeah. So, uh, rest of the world, uh, EB3. Let's get that question back up here. Uh, October 2022, EB3 skilled worker. Uh, well, um, so, so yeah, the rest of the world's skilled worker. Okay, so that is going to be oh, skilled worker. So sorry, yeah. first of December, so third, yeah, first of February. Uh, that's the fun, sorry, those are filing dates. We want the final action dates for uh, EB three uh, skilled workers. There we are, first of December twenty twenty one, where it's at, and you are in October of twenty twenty two, which is a year off, huh? Not so, not so, uh, not so terrible. Um, well, projection is projection. Where you know, you know how often you are uh, wrong in projecting, uh, one hundred percent. Because half the time you over project, and half the time you under project. Uh, so we're wrong most of the time because we're just projecting. But I would give this, in my opinion, 
about uh, maybe by middle of next year, uh, in my opinion. I was giving it a little, giving a little bit, bit more more time than that. I have. Uh, then again, I know when we saw that report of you know the I one forty report of who's really out there waiting. Um, there's not that many, not that many, many people. So maybe I'm gonna, maybe I'm. In, I was thinking more like you know a year, but maybe I'm more inclined to uh, really. In. I guess you know here's here's an answer I like to give. I wouldn't be surprised if that date became current in this in this fiscal year. That would be wonderful. Yeah, I, I would not. You I, would. I, I, think I, I would not blessing, be flabbergasted. Blessing would be very happy with you, Brian. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Yes. Well, I, I, yeah, I would not. I would not be going. What? That's impossible. I'd say, okay, well, it was within their own possibility. There's a follow up. I think. Yeah. Uh, oh yes. So yes, the follow up. Also, any thoughts on the December Visa Bulletin predictions for the January one? Are you expecting a big jump? We have stopped predicting because, like I said. Um, I was rolled back into my uh, uh, days when I went to engineering school and it was stressed to me that um, anytime I was a civil engineer, anytime you design a structure, you're either under designing or over designing. I hope you, mostly over designing. Well, that's what everybody mm -hmm. trying to do, right? Yeah. Uh, so same thing with guessing. Uh, you're either over-guessing or under-guessing. We don't know yet. So I haven't looked at it close enough, Brian, to, re re to uh, well, predict it. It's, it's very difficult to predict correctly. I, I would fully, fully agree. Um, uh, correct, correctly, I don't So keep in mind, uh, under the law, uh, Blessing, uh, the Visa Bulletin is a guess. <coughs> it is not a guarantee. It's not required to, they're not required, uh, even though it says they should, not everybody gets a visa in the right order, and just because your priority date is, you know, in October 2022, there's no guarantee that you're going to get your green card before people with the priority date of October 2020. Uh, sorry, November 2022, uh, for example. They do these things. They they there's a perfect system, and the system that we have is only a stress drives to, to be that. Uh, for the January January visa bulletin, uh, a big jump. I am doubtful. Uh, some sort of uh, lurch forward. I wouldn't, that wouldn't surprise me too much. If you've watched me here, you've known that I've been saying, look to the January Visa Bulletin because that's when I would expect to see some sort of in increased visa, new visa availability, which would translate to Visa Bulletin. They've bulletin. told us that they're holding back yeah. until the first quarter. Yeah, quarter, quarterly, quarterly uh, visa So there'll be some movement, not big movement. Yeah. That would be probably my, yeah. my guess. All right, sounds good. So uh, from Sai here, who has another question. I have a third question as well. My AP application is still pending. However, my EAD card has the AP stamp in it. Does that mean I have the EAD AP combo card? Well, uh, for me, my concern there, Sai, is the AP doesn't come as a uh, stamp. It comes as a little endorsement. Uh, maybe that's what he Maybe means. that's what he, he's, he's re So, until and unless I see the card, I cannot comment. Well, yeah, that, yeah, uh, of course, yeah. But if you haven't received the paper approval, but you have a card that says authorized to travel, uh, or whatever the wording is for advanced parole, uh, and with a date on it, that means you're authorized to travel. But but I agree, if he, if he checks online and says spending, but he has a card that says approved, to me, I wouldn't travel with that advanced yeah, parole. Yeah, I've actually encountered this scenario, scenario before recently, and, yeah. you know, uh, I wouldn't fault somebody who took the government issued document at face value and you know used it, but my inclination is the conservative immigration attorney who doesn't want to see you uh, not be able to travel back to your home country is that you should inquire in this and see that it's fixed or resolved. The reason they take you to secondary is to check online whether the advanced parole is approved or not. That's a good point. And if they look at it and it says it's not approved yet, and you have a card, they're going to say you're not approved. Because I could see that going really, really bad, badly. I mean, presuming that there are doing, you know, there's some sort of fraud uh, involved. Yeah. Well, I mean, they can beat up on the on the guy. It'll be a negative experience. But the truth is the truth. He's going to say, "I got this card, and this is what I got." But the problem is, if you know anything about customs uh, border folks, uh, CBP, uh, if it is is the if the glass half empty or half full, it's always half empty. Um, and therefore, don't assume they're going to give you the benefit of the doubt. So I wouldn't use it. That's yeah, I, I'm in, inclined to uh, agree with that because you know, as much as you sputter and say, "Well, they gave it to me," uh, I relied on it. You figure that out for that, that out from outside the country, the country, and we'll yeah. we'll see you then. Yeah, you know. Yeah, we're very sorry. 
book your you know, book your return ticket or yeah. something. Yeah. So uh, from uh, Morali, are there available statistics from the U.S. Department of State regarding the number of individuals from India who, with priority dates in in uh, 2012, 2013, and 2014, remain in the green card waiting line? Um, well, this is one of these things that also no one knows until you. Um, yeah, this is the sort of thing where I've tried to where I tried to, to, to figure these things out before. You, but you can't. We, you, yeah, there's all. Believe me, as soon as you try to run that calculation, somebody will will find a you'll find a aha uh -huh, a flaw a flaw in it. If somebody dropped out of the line by simply leaving the country, you don't you don't know. There's that. no information. Yeah. Uh, and there are a lot of people that drop out, and then when the visa bulletin becomes current, they contact their employer that they haven't talked to for nine years, and they'll say, um, it looks like my, my uh, I-140 is current. Would you take me back? And we've had those cases. Oh, definitely. I'm a Canadian citizen now. I live in Canada. Uh, yeah. Take I'll, me back? Sure, I'll, yeah. I'll, sure. Okay. Uh, file his adjustment, please. Yeah, or counselor processing in that case. The closest I've gotten to, you know, to the, I think the closest that any sort of information you get on this is actually in USCIS data where they publish, you know, like by year how many per country I-140s are approved. But any time we've really tried to um, slice that up and try to translate it into something, you know, actionable, um, uh, it's, it's not worth the time. I guess I would say this. Those are dates, this is 2012, 2013, 2014, um, that are current, that have been current before, right? And they, we know, everybody knows somebody with a 2013 to 2014 priority date, EB2, EB3, India, who has gotten their green card when somebody else in the 2012 uh, realm, or, you know, somebody else uh, didn't. How many times do you get a call from one of your clients and say, I got this candidate. He was in the United States a long time before. Yeah. He has an approved I-140 from 2009. Yeah. Uh, and I want to file an h one b He's been outside the U.S. for 14 years. And now his kids are gone to college, and he's ready to come back and work and apply for a green card. Can we do that? Yeah. And you say yes. The only possibility if, if the State Department canceled his yeah. I-140. Yeah. And we have to check whether that's happened or not. And even if it did, if you find the old labor, perm labor certification, which is a tall order, if it's done in my office, I probably have that record. Uh, yeah, you, you might can be, refile yeah, the I-140. Yeah, I guess you can refile the I-140. You can I refile the I-140 I I yeah. again, potentially, and uh, and get it going. So figuring out how many dropped out yeah. through the pipeline is impossible. Who is in that line depends upon the individual hearts and minds of the people who are who are capable of being in that line, which flip flop back and forth uh, yeah. all the time. Yeah, it's a great point. Uh, but I think uh, it, it, some of the stuff that you know we have to do is trying to clean up some of the stuff, making you know, like expiration for these documents. I mean, it's not a popular thing for a lot of people. Yeah, but, yeah, I, I but wanted some, to get out my some pitchfork for as soon as you uh, suggested it. You know, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think I don't think you can do that right now in good faith by virtue of the fact that you know uh, there's such a broken process with such long wait times. How do you really want to punish people system. who have been waiting? It's a system that is. It's like a forest, you know? Every turn, there's a tree that has a story. Everything has a history. And it's so convoluted that it's almost impossible to fix almost. Yeah, because well, if you fix it, you're gonna, somebody's going to feel hurt. And The impact, yeah. 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 So, uh, will a rune. Yeah, from Arun Prasad. Will, will EB2 April 2012 be current in fiscal year 2024? Well, uh, again, uh, EB2, um, April 2012, um, that doesn't seem outside the realm of possibility for me. Uh, for the November Beast of Bolton. Uh, three months movement? Three months of, this year? of, of, of move, movement. Again, these dates in January through March 2012 have been, and through April 2012, have been current before. Tons of people in this period of time have gotten green cards, meaning the density, I'm going to use the forest metaphor, there's less, you know, if you're a, I'm going to come up with a terrible metaphor, Sam, you're driving your car, your car through a forest. The density of those trees, uh, uh, right for this head on, to, the density of those trees is going to determine how far you get. And if there's less trees, you're going to, your car's going to get less banged up, you're going to go further before the whole thing kind of blows up and stops. Hey, that metaphor kind of worked. I'm, I, I'm, I'm liking it. A reminder for everybody. Yeah. I like the metaphor. 
January 1st, 2012 represent the, the, the date or the last case that is available to process. So, so it, there could be huge gaps. So that movement can be very fast forward. Yeah. So yeah, but they have no cases between very opaque January January first and uh, you know January or yeah what a or few date. cases yeah you know so it's the last so they have so a case. if there are less trees in that region of the for forest is, is, is you what, what you're light. saying you're saying your freight train or car or your vehicle is just gonna gonna plow through there e easy if there, if there's few or you can see more light or, or more 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 light sure. Yeah. So, so the date does not reflect, I mean, that movement can be aggressive yeah. because, because it, there aren't a whole lot of cases that are held. Well, it's less than there might have, might have been, at, at least. Yeah. We don't know how many there are. It's really hard to calculate, but there are less than there might Clearly have been less. If, if, if we didn't have the benefit of COVID and the massive visa availability that yeah. uh, came along. And that 2012 case could be somebody that... Um, Moved from EB3 to EB2, yeah. uh, filed a new perm and transferred it, and that's why they held it and they say, okay, we're going to call it that date because this is the case. Yeah, but there could be between 2000, uh, you know, the three months period, you know, that he's trying to read, there could be only 50 cases. I mean, obviously an exaggeration, but few numbers. So, yeah, very possible to move forward, in my opinion. That's the conclusion, yeah. I guess. Moving on to the next one, Brian, and yeah. don't, no more metaphor from you, please. No, no. My first one just, fell, just fell, hold fell, 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 fell apart. My second one of driving your car into the woods is excellent, okay. and it works very well. Okay. <laughs> Chan, uh, from Chanda Khan. Uh, hello, sir. I see that there were more number of stipulated H-1B issues for the years 1999 through 2003. Is there any way we can file a lawsuit to uh, issue more number of green cards for these uh, excess numbers of H-1Bs? Now, Sam, can you tell us about uh, the historical availability of H-1B visas back to, to uh, 1999, 2003? Yes. A lot of you guys probably were still in college or high school. I was practicing law. Um, I was specifically in college and high school around that time. Uh, yeah. I think I was in high school around that time. Yeah. So, uh, so Y2K... Right, Y2K is was the biggest fear, okay, and the talk in the year 1999 about I remember this about January 1st, 2000, ATM machines will not work. Uh, a bank, very pop popular news topic. Banking topic. systems will crash. The stock market will crash. Uh, you, the phone system will not work uh, because. Nothing was billed for the date 2000. It was everything 1990-something, 80-something. Uh, and there was a big paranoia uh, in Congress. And Congress got together you, because you, of the you, fear. You mean, you mean the, the incredibly old folks in Cong Congress were made to, to fear the uh, Y2K uh, yes. bug? Yeah. And, and they increased the numbers. I think 165,000 or 128,000, some ridiculous. Yeah, it's still uh, yeah. memorialized in the law. It basically says yeah. these couple of years we're going to. And they stepped it down, but they we filed. We filed. I don't think we hit the max that year. We couldn't hit the max, but it was wide open to file as many H1Bs as any company wanted, and green cards. People would say, labor certification were flying back. The the sooner you submit them, the sooner they're approved, Brian. Well, labor certifications being on a different process. Uh, at, but at, but at it's time, yeah. but everybody was freaking out, and everybody wanted the IT. They don't. Nobody wanted to give IT people a hard time. And I, I remember this guy. I ran into him many years later, and he said, "You approve. You got my green card approved in six months. Record time. I've never heard of this in my life. You're a great lawyer. I wasn't a great lawyer." It was the Y2K. They were they yeah. were handing out green cards. Yeah. They were handing out H1Bs. That's what was happening then. Well, that's completely different. So yeah. that's history. So um, is there any way we can file a lawsuit to issue more number of GTs, GCs for these excess number of H1Bs? And uh, this is an interesting point. They seem to have issued H1Bs to resolve the Y2K problem for their convenience without increasing the proportionate number of uh, green cards uh, during uh, those years. So I guess I would point out, Sam, that that was a change in the law that, that made them, them uh them do that and you know if they wanted to make more green cards available they have to do that through a change in the law so um, you cannot sue basic law basic u.s law i think in any country probably uh, as well 
a common law, and I'm sure in India is the same. You cannot sue the government for policy decisions unless the policy is uh, violate fundamental rights. Yeah. Um, so policies like this does not violate fundamental rights. Fundamental rights is the right to be free. Speech, assembly, um, privacy of living your private life, things like that. Yeah. You know, religions, you know, um, discrimination, things like that. Uh, so these laws, any laws that goes violate fundamental rights, you can sue the government. But these, in terms of increasing visas, decreasing visas, this is incredibly political. You cannot it is it is the law the laws they write and they basically consciously made the choice to increase the availability of H-1B visas without to turn up the immigrant visas accordingly. Yeah. Accordingly, keep in mind, I guess you know, at the heart of its hearts, uh, H-1Bs are a temporary visa, and not necessarily everybody who comes to the United States on an H-1B visa is planning to stay in uh, forever. So that's that's the that's the first counter argument you would make in front of the judge. Um, if you were the government attorney, if I yeah the government attorney and, and then uh, then Brian the private attorney over, over would, would step in and say well what are the statistics on the actual uh, use of uh, use of uh, you know the green card programs for people on H one B H one B visas and I don't know it's probably quite probably quite high right. um, and is it a reasonable expectation yeah. to spend fifteen years of your life. And not yeah, get but the bottom line is, it's a matter just a matter of the law. The laws are written one way. If they don't yeah. want to, if the Congress folks, you know, it's, it's a political question essentially. It's the, the, Ameri the American legal system has a, a colorful history in uh, making laws that make any don't make any sense and quite down in, in unacceptable. I guess not illegal, unacceptable in today's world. You know, you know, we've had the laws that says no Asians can come to the U.S. Yep. Um, Asian Exclusion Act, I think it's called. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, and um, and we've had laws where we've uh, divided Chinese Exclusion Act. Yeah. Uh, we've divided the visa availability based on country, and even in Europe there were discrimination. So, like you know, country, people coming from Italy was a smaller number. People coming from Germany was a bigger number, um, and that was all built into the laws to encourage Western. Yeah, uh, it's white people immigration as opposed to I did to the research people. on this uh, re recently. It wasn't until I think around like the, maybe it's <laughs> 1960s until they basically sort of got rid of you know essentially racist parts of the uh, immigration immigration laws. I mean, I think uh, I remember reading it somewhere it wasn't it wasn't legal for Indians to immigrate to the United States until until 19, 1950 and only in some very small numbers. I did the research for when we did that event uh, a, while, a while back. Interesting stuff out there, for sure. Yeah. So, yeah. So we, we, we cannot sue the government for these things and expect to prevail, yeah. Yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. All right, take the next one, Ryan. So from Abigail Hunt. I understand they're not moving the dates much to prevent retrogression in the summer, but it's unfortunate the filing chart won't be used for the entire year, but I understand why. Sigh. You know, um, that, that whether or not uh, they uh, take those, that's a real, real great big frustration, the arbitrary way by which USCIS chooses to, uh, you know, go by the dates for filing uh, or not. I mean, fundamentally, it's probably by what their, work, their workload, right, if we don't have the... Uh, well, clearly, clearly the, um, the cry for... Um, uh, for holding these people on H-1Bs forever has to get to somebody's ear eventually. Yeah. Um, and handing out five-year EADs and five-year advanced parole does not fix the problem. Yeah. There has to be, we've, we've had such a massive number of immigrants who are on visas waiting for the green card so large that something has to be given to these people because the economy is dependent on them. There is no question that the U.S. economy is dependent on the 700,000 people stuck in the backlog yeah. who are mostly engineers and professional, oh, IT yeah. professionals. If you got a magic wand made and disappear, whew, I have a couple four-letter words for where the country would stand, you know, uh, in yeah. that scenario. Yeah. It's, it's a, of, a, of, a, of a significant national importance yeah. uh, that uh, something has to be done. But yes, uh, it's frustrating. Yeah. Uh, let's see what we got here from OEGR12. Does my crystal ball say, which is right here. Yes, a crystal globe. Yeah. Um, Does the crystal ball say that the visa bulletin will move forward for family? And uh, the work, the work uh, table. 
Uh, you know, we don't talk that much about the family-based stuff in this venue, but oh, I will tell you, the family stuff is extraordinarily uh, uh, fr frustrating. Uh, that it just seems to have been perpetually stuck uh, forever. Not only that, gotten worse for the longest time, Sam. We had the F2A category for uh, spouses of permanent residents uh, current, and now it's back in you know 2019 for uh, everybody. So quick. So quick, but you know, forget about that. Uh, how about spouse of a U.S. citizen? Pro I want 30 processing times, oh. 36 months. Yeah. And uh, delay litigation is the name of the game. Uh, and we've helped people uh, when the government delay was so absurd. Uh, and they say, well, you know, it's within processing time. It doesn't matter within processing time. Uh, yeah. 36 months is unacceptable time frame to process 9130 and unify a U.S. citizen with his or her spouse. Well, yeah, I used to tell people, I remember a long time ago, I used to tell people, ah, six months to get a, fi get a fiance here. Pretty good, pretty good chance, of, uh, chance of that. Now I'm, I'm usually telling people year and a half, and if you're already their, their spouse, you're looking at like two years plus. It's... Oh, more than two years. More than two uh, years. It's plus, and yeah, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, but, uh, but that is unacceptable. And, um, I, you know, I will file the I-130, and honestly, in about 12 months, just uh, take it to court. Yeah. Let them go in front of a judge. You know, the most the most challenging part of our like family practice in the last couple really it's kind of since you know COVID hit is helping managing the expectations of people because you know uh, it's I want my husband child parent here to be soon and it's just an incredibly long painful some painful wait. Some people you know uh, came to us after four years of waiting and then fi and we finally filed lawsuits for them. And we're able to, you know, bring bring the spouse to the U.S. Well, yeah, and the most frustrating, and, and, you know, they, they get emotionally sick. The, the relationship is strained. Yeah, it, it, it's it's, it's this, a relationship they, destroyer. They will they will they've been known to, you know, uh, basically starve the relationship. Uh, we won't have to do our work, issue visas if you know you guys break up. You know, because you have the absolute terrible stress and anxiety of being in a long distance relationship with the person you love, and you're trying to uh, trying to get here for the last. X amount of uh, years. I'm going to digress and say a couple of things about this issue because this is an important issue because it's a humanitarian oh. And you issue. can't premium process an I-130 uh, petition as, a, as an aside. Yeah. The people who are affected the most are the people in the uh, lower income and lower education. Uh, and they're related usually. And the reason they are more affected is because obviously access to attorneys is, is more difficult, you yeah. know. Uh, I get people shocked, and our f we're very reasonable attorneys in fees, I think, but they're shocked when they hear how much it takes at the cost to do these cases uh, because their income is low, mm -hmm. and also their well, stamina. In that in that scenario, then they'll say, "I'll go it alone." And you know, it, there's people who successfully do these things without an attorney, but you know, it helps. To, it, sometimes it helps to ha have one. And I just was talking to somebody recently. You know, he uh, kind of misunderstood a, a request for evidence on an I-130. You got a recent denial, and as the original I-130 was filed in April of 2021. You know, yeah. over two, over two years years now, ago. Now, now yeah. start all over again, or trying to reopen the case. Yeah, yeah, that's what we're what we're talking about uh, t today, and you know, it's it's miserable. And you know, a couple of years ago, I said, you know, you, you know, maybe it's not worth it to file an appeal. Maybe you just go ahead and uh, you know. You file a new case, but now. Yeah, it's it's. One hundred percent. You got to yeah. file an appeal. And good luck if they will allow uh, allow that uh, motion to reconsider because obviously, you know, we've seen also reluctance to uh, to recognize well, well, the impact. Yeah. Well, don't get get me started. I mean, you know, I wonder. You wonder why people, you know, don't give the government the responses they wanted. I mean, have you read an RFE from the uh, government? I understand why it's there, but it's full of, you know, boilerplate language, repeating legal requirements that don't really say what they want. You know, I have on my desk a four page RF, RFE and which is about for an L1B visa. It has all sorts of talk in there about, you know, what the requirements are for an L1B visa, qualifying relations. If you work abroad, you work here. All they want is one thing. All they want is some more pay stubs. From, from the person, a single they, they line. They four pages. But they create a four page R R RFE R to do R that. R and they wonder why people, why the lay person gets lost in, in that. And again, it's, I don't know, is it bad faith? Is it bad faith to issue complex, silly requests that, that uh, confuse, confuse people? And for people on the family side, when they get these RFEs and they can't even read it, let alone have an attorney, you know, afford an attorney to respond to it, 
it's horrible. Yeah, and, and on the RFEs it says, you know, we'll deny your case if you don't if you don't give give us a give us a response. I mean, the rules for you know, it's you must it's you must give everything at once, and they don't really inform you of the ramifications of not doing private. It's not a you friendly know, system. You know, I tell you, um, uh, I always talk about the good old days, Brian. The good old days when we had I one thirties. I'm talking 15, 20 years ago, and you reply, and the client replies, and it was unsatisfactory. They didn't deny the cases. They issued a second RFE. They gave you a second chance because they knew this is your wife, and you are a U.S. citizen, and they want to help you. And you're gonna get this case approved anyways. She's your wife. That, that's well, you know. So why deny it? So uh, they would issue a second RFE. They will say. We're gonna give you one more chance. You did not satisfy. Well, yeah, I'm gonna if, if if this person you know wants to wants our help, I'm gonna be forced to write write an emotion. It's gonna it's gonna come with a promise and a threat. His wife is coming to the United States. Uh, I've talked to him long enough. I have no doubt as to that yeah. they're married. They have kids. He has the records. So don't they have children. Yeah, too. yeah. That's horrible. Yeah. yeah. It, it's yeah. It, it's that's I guess that's the part of our practice that makes me angry sometimes is how people get mistreated by USCIS. Let's take the next one. Yeah. Um, okay, Abigail Hunt. What I don't understand is why hide the data for I-45 based on the category and country of chargeability? We will all know there is a backlog. Uh, why hide the data? Oh, the answer is very simple, uh, Abigail. They don't want you to know so you don't ask intelligent questions. And the more intelligent questions you can ask, the more difficult it's going to be for them to answer. And they like to hide behind data so they don't get bothered. You know, it's it's a standard yeah. uh, standard government, unfortunately, operating procedure. This reminds me of my usual want that I always get, you know, depressed about the prospect of. Oh, I want to put in a FOIA request for that. I bet they have that data. They'll never give me give me that that uh, that data. I bet uh, you know you put in a FOIA request for that. I highly doubt doubt you you you'll, you'll get it. And, and you know, the, you know, we we are members of the American Immigration Lawyers Association. It's an association of immigration attorneys across the U.S. and across the world. U.S. immigration attorneys. Uh, they always file uh, what, what we call FOIA lawsuit, Freedom of Information Act lawsuit, because they will send a request and they will give them a blah, blah answer, and they're going to say that's not what we asked for. And they end up going to court and forcing the government to release data. And they will always push us to go to court to, really, to get the data because they don't want to give it to you because they don't want you to know. Yeah. And they don't want you to know because they don't want you to ask the question because they do not want to do their job yeah. the way it's supposed to be done. Uh, I guess we're on a, like an attorney attorney rant about the government right now, but I, you know, it doesn't happen that much. But there have been plenty of cases, you know, where uh, we have pushed the government for information for explanation when we kind of zeroed on something where we don't think they had a good one, and that's when they fall apart. You know, they uh, if you catch them in, in a lie, essentially, uh, they will they will well if you realize if you make them realize records garbage you know I'm thinking uh, it, that's when you win, that's when you win, when you win cases uh, procedural stuff you know you guys you didn't do X and Y and Z before you made, made this made this decision you know um, they act, like to act like they're they are on very on top of it everything's official 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 but I mean the things we we get from the government in our office sometimes Sam I have on my desk right now a second request for evidence from the, um, for an individual's case because the government lost their RFE, excuse me, excuse me their, their, their H-4 extension, two times. Uh, they, we sent them the case. Uh, they issued an RFE saying, eh, we lost it. Uh, literally, about 10 days after we sent them, here's, here's another copy of the case, here's another copy of the form just in case they need them, another RFE saying, we lost the case. What would happen to you if you lost a client case? Um, I, uh, the, 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 the bar would ask you to hand over your license to practice law. Yeah, yeah. And Let's take the next yeah, one. Yeah. So, so, uh, so, sorry to those who uh, were not angry, angry at you. You asked us very good questions, which got, which got us uh, on a roll. Yeah, so uh, I, there think, we are. I think we're right here. Uh, no, I think we're one above that. Right here, yeah. All right. Uh, so, Kasranini uh, Var Prasad. Yes. Layoff question. Does the six-day notice starts after stop working with the company or after the payroll ends? For big organizations, generally, they offer a three-month notice, wondering what the rule says. Secession of, of employment. employment. We both know this because we've we've had had a little, uh, let's say, a little, a little, uh, not little, 
but lots of arguments on this subject as to uh, what it means. I'll start with the conservative interpretation. Um, employment means, uh, you know, work, do labor for money, and I would say your conservative answer begins with the day you stop providing that labor is the day your 60-day grace period begins. But that's not how USCIS interprets it. Agree, agrees. If you hand them a pay, a pay stub. So, uh, so yeah. USCIS, at least right now, and that subject to change because, you know, that's how they're the government. Yep. Uh, they are giving you the benefit of the doubt, meaning that if you have a paycheck st stub, the day that ends, even though let's say you have a severance pay, uh, and that severance pay is two months of payroll, uh, or a check that was issued later, more than likely they will take the end of that date as the beginning of the 60-day grace period. Don't count on it. Yeah. We argue that when we don't have a choice, I'd rather I don't think we've ever actually, ever actually had to had to had to. I'd rather not argue. Yeah, it. I would. I would. You know yeah. what I mean? When because yeah, I would worry about that manifesting. You know, six years later when you're applying for a green card, when they're looking for gaps in you know your immigration status. In, in, when they have a different interpretation and a, a different administration and a different attitude exactly. altogether. Yeah. Uh, but yes, but right now they're giving you the benefit of the doubt. But ask an attorney, in your case, because this is really critical. But obviously, if you're beyond the 60 day already. Uh, yeah, good lawyer with good uh, experience should put together an oh, application. What for about you. that ho that whole thing? And I believe they uh, I don't believe they stopped doing it. If it's you know, oh, change to file to change to B, then file to change back to H one B, and we'll approve those on a, on a premium a processing time point. time frame. Yeah. yeah. So if you're getting close to the end of the sixty days, the government has given you an out because obviously they want to keep people here. This administration. Yeah. They said file for a B, change the status to a B visa. And then file from a B to an H one B, and we will approve both at the same time. In essence, they've taken that sixty day grace period unofficially and blow it to a one year grace period. Yeah, I'm, ex exactly. It's uh, it's, and that's why immigration law is complicated. It's it's things shift like the wind, the political and, winds. And and you really need to talk to an attorney that knows their stuff to help you out. Yeah. All right, let's take the next one here. We're running out of time, and we want to yeah. um, take care of as many people as we can. Uh, Brian, take it. Can one person hold more than one W-2 for multiple employers? Is it okay to have multiple I-9 forms for two employers? Well, me, I have several. I, I mean, I, I'm just that's me. That's me making a joke that I have several several other you jobs. Do, you you do have several. The, the I work at the ice cream ice cream parlor on 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 Sundays. I wear a white cap. Um, uh, so as an immigrant, good, good ice cream. <laughs> I wouldn't. I, 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 I would abuse that employee discount at the ice, ice cream parlor. Is the problem I would hit. Well, so as a general matter, you can have W twos and I nines from as many companies as you want. For me, simultaneously. Simultaneously. Yes. However, it's an immigration compliance question. Uh, question for somebody. You know, if you're on H one B status, you're only allowed to work for your approved H one B employer who has an approved H one B petition on your behalf. Uh, you can do a simultaneous employment uh, concurrent H one B. Uh, no problem, uh, and you can have W twos from those multiple com multiple companies. No problem if you have an unlimited EAD like the green card EAD. You can have multiple I multiple I nines, multiple W twos. Yeah, we'll leave it alone. You have more to say? What? Uh, let's take the next one. All right, all right. No, no, I agree with you 100%. But you know, we as lawyers digress sometimes and go oh, into all over the place. I'm the king of that, sir. I'm trying to hold hold it back. All right. Uh, Vincat CH, can I work for two full-time jobs on H4 EAD and one job 40 hours for federal client via vendor and other one directly with another federal client for 40 hours? I think I, I guess, guy I guess, is calling I, out the, the thing, I, the thing guess, that you didn't, didn't bring up. I Go guess ahead. The, I guess the last word that he didn't or she didn't type, he didn't type, is simultaneously. I think the question yeah. is can yeah. I do this simultaneously? Yeah. Is it legal? Is this the issue that you weren't you weren't going to bring up, but now you're going to be forced to bring it up? Yeah. Wow. Awesome. Yeah. Good so, question. So let's do the math here. Um, eight hours mm -hmm. is full time job. I'm assuming. Sure. Uh, two of them is sixteen hours. Okay. Now, um, and then um, he's not doing it anymore. Sixteen hours a day. Yeah. So that leaves eight hours. Yeah. To sleep. What about weekends? Eat, yeah. Okay, 
So I did that when I went to law school, and I know what that means because I worked full-time job and went to law school. Um, it is not humanly manageable to do that, but if you can document it legally that you've done this work, good for you. Where the problem arises is the fact that uh, neither one knows about the other employment. Neither job knows about the, the other Yeah, neither job. one of yeah. the two. Uh, they don't know about each other. And a lot of time, it is very likely that there are agreements, private agreements in place that restrict that activity that you're doing. And therefore, there could be a breach of contract that your employer may be engaged in doing that. And those are the questions and those are the issues. Now, assuming there's none of that, and if you are a superhuman, I guess fine. The question later on becomes, are you really putting 40 hours a week honestly? Are you turning timesheets that are dishonest? And that's the second problem. Yeah. But if you can document that in fact that you're putting in 16 hour days, um, yeah, even, yeah. so I guess the, the point you're making is if company A finds about company company B and, you know, they start asking you questions, uh, you know, they will start really kind of zeroing in, getting out the microscope for your time, uh, for example. You might not have a good, have a good time. Yeah. Yeah. And kind of the flip side of it in real life, company A may be aware and company B may be aware, but this employee is so valuable and they don't care how much they're paying, they're getting what they're getting and life goes on. Yeah, salaried employees, um, sure, yeah. Yeah, uh, but so there's a lot of complication. This, is, uh, uh, this does not smell good kind of a, a scenario and I know a lot of people are doing it because of COVID and working from home. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of, it's, it's a very common thing that's happening and right now everybody's kind of looking the other way and nobody's kind of addressing it. Yeah. Um, even USCIS, um, maybe not getting into it yet, but this will uh, blow up wide open. Well, I guess I'd point out, this is an H4 EAD question, and on H4 EAD, that's an unlimited work for wherever you want, be the janitor, be the president of the company. The EAD. question is whether there's fraud involved by the employee, mm, okay, you know, so, and that creates a problem for the green card application. Well, I mean, is it legal is about, is not just one question, it's about 20 different different kind of, que of questions. Yeah, I mean, if you're doing, if you're in fact doing 16 hours, and if everybody knows about everybody, and every, all, everything is on the table, yeah. yeah, as long as every, everybody's happy, yeah. I just doubt that that is possible. Yeah, I would, I, I'm inclined yeah. to uh, agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. I think we crossed 7 o'clock, so let's take one more, Brian, here. Okay. Yeah. Are we getting standalone AP approval for five years? I already got uh, EAD. So we are seeing combined EAD AP approvals. Um, but it doesn't mean that he is not, cannot get standalone. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I would we, we, yeah. yeah, so, you know, there's no clarification cl on what they're doing. So I'm not going to say no. Your mileage, your mileage may, may, may vary. Don't count on it until it's in your hands and yeah. marked approved by the government. Yep. Last one, Brian. Yeah, let's make, make sure it's a good one. Um, when will April 2014 EB2 India get current, Sam? Uh, I'm going to go look at the final action dates for uh, employment-based EB2 India, uh, tw April 2014. That's quite a long ways uh, off. That is. But again, that has was it current. Has, it has been current. current. You're entirely and you're entirely therefore right. that movement could be sudden forward. Now, if one were to want to use a metaphor, you would say uh, there's, uh, there's more light coming through those uh, those uh, trees. If you wanted to use a beautiful metaphor, for example, if you wanted to use a crass, a crash loud, a crass and loud metaphor, it'd be a vehicle driving f th through those uh, woods. Um, All right. With that, we should probably conclude today. Thank you guys for listening to us today. Uh, I hope this was helpful. Um, come back six o'clock uh, Eastern time next week on Monday, and we'll spend one more hour with you. Take care. Have a